Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1%. A real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Quick note before we begin, the Finding Genius Foundation, as part of the Finding Genius Podcast, has recently completed a book about understanding viruses. So the creation of this book was to interview a 100 virologists, ask them a lot of deep, difficult questions, take the most difficult questions, and then re-interview the top 25 or so and ask them the hardest questions I could think of. And we compiled that all into a book. So you'll see question and four or five experts' answers. Question, four or five experts' answers. There's about 30 questions in the book. I think it's a great read for the layperson and for the researcher. talks about a lot of speculation in the world of viruses, such as are they alive or not? And why is it important? Uh, why do viruses go latent or hidden or ineffective or sit in a person or an animal or another creature for weeks, months, years, and then suddenly become virulent and affect that person? Uh, so there's a lot of really provocative questions in the book. It's now on Amazon. So if you go to Amazon and type in Finding Genius, you'll see the book on viruses. It's also on Kindle. The Audible version is in production and should be ready in approximately a month. But if you want to go and order it now, uh, you can do so again by going to Amazon or Kindle or go, go to FindingGeniusFoundation.org and go to Publications. There's an opportunity as well to get the transcripts of all the interviews and to hear the original interviews themselves. If we had put them all together, the book would be about a thousand pages, but we condensed them down to make it juicy and concise and tight and very interesting. So I hope you'll check out the book. Uh, we're now working on one about cancer, but this is going to be our goal is uh, three times a year to come out with these masterclass books that I think will inspire new scientific research, and I hope you'll check it out. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have Sanjeev Sabluk. He's an economist in Melbourne, Australia. He's had a long history in working with governments. In 1982, he was part of the Indian Administrative Service in the Haryana cadre. It was a permanent senior civil service position in India that's incredibly competitive to get into. I guess the hundreds of thousands of people apply and literally probably a hundred are accepted every year. And then he moved and he worked uh, as deputy commissioner of Barpeta District, professor of management at Lal Baladur National Academy of Administration and commissioner to the state government of Meghalaya. This is all part of the government of India. And then he realized, unfortunately, I guess that uh, India's government was, was so corrupt that he had to leave. And he switched and he ended up um, moving to uh, Australia. But uh, I guess in working with the government there, it probably was no better. But we'll hear that from him. So, uh, Sanjeev, thanks for coming. Uh, thank you, Richard, for having me. Yeah. Well, tell me a little bit about your, your latest position. How long were you with the government of Australia and what did you do for them? Like what kind of advisory capacity were you with? So essentially, I, I came to Australia in uh, December 2000 and uh, got a role in the Australian uh, government department, a regulator, the Victorian Work Cover Authority. So I've been working effectively for 20 years in the Victorian government, of which about 15 years was as, uh, as an economist uh, in the uh, regulatory policy and uh, planning, urban planning, agriculture policy, etc. various policy areas uh, in the uh, division that advised the cabinet uh, office of Victoria on all uh, basically, all cabinet submissions are advised by this economic division, by different economists in different areas. So it's an economic policy role, really. Yeah. And what was it like working for the government for all those years as an economist? Like, what, what kind of issues would you work on? And do you feel like you made a difference? Yeah, I think uh, the first thing we in economics is one of those disciplines that is uh, somewhat non-intuitive. And uh, people in general have a strong tendency, and I'm talking of departments and even ministers, they have a strong tendency to take on a significant role for the state or in you know whatever the government is in order to implement their objectives. Little realizing the unintended consequences and the fact that markets can do most of these things better. So an example would be town planning, where we had such extraordinary restrictions on, on housing development in Melbourne that uh, the house prices are at least double, if not more, than, say, Houston, which has got virtually, you know, half the planning restrictions or very few relatively 
except car parking and few things. So, so what we see here is that the, the average punter in the, in the government departments is not aware of the possibility and does not respect the possibility of markets resolving issues through bargaining. And, you know, like Ronald's, uh, Ronald Coase's theorem, I'm not sure you're familiar with that, but that's, uh, he's a Nobel Prize winner. There's a lot of, I'm not familiar. What is the theorem? Yeah. So Ronald Coase's theorem was basically saying that if there is any negative externality, which is what they claim. So many of these interventions by the government across the world, including in the USA, in many parts, uh, including New York, et cetera, there's restrictions in, in city planning are founded on the assumption that people are unable to bargain and uh, resolve matters by themselves. But, uh, Ronald Coase basically said that if the transaction costs are low, and at that point was uh, further uh, disputed by Harold Demsetz, uh, who was a great friend of mine and uh, a professor in uh, California, he died a couple of years ago. Ronald Coase is also dead, by the way, at the age of 100. So uh, what, what these guys said is that there is a strict, significant possibility, even in complex situations, that the markets will resolve the situation in an efficient manner, whereas the governments will generally have one size fit all approach, which will lead to great amount of inefficiencies in society. So I can go on and on on this particular issue. <laughs> Town okay, planning is a phenomenal sense, uh, area of, uh, you know. So what we find is that as, a, as an economist, uh, our job in the government was essentially to provide cabinet with the alternative view in terms of policy when the departments would come to us. So it has been a very challenging exercise because uh, uh, economics is not intuitive, as I said. Uh, but having said that, I think we were able to achieve significant improvements uh, in many areas, including in town planning and urban planning. So, yeah, and of course, in agriculture, et cetera. So we've, what we have achieved in Victoria over the past, and I've written a book on this, this not on video. So that's uh, Breaking Free of Nehru, which is in which I have a complete chapter on the wonderful system of governance in Australia. Now, the problem, I guess, happened in this particular case with COVID, uh, where the matters became so disproportionate. So we have a risk-based approach in all cases. You know, there's a the regulatory policy area where I worked in. We, we're talking about risk-based approaches, performance-based approaches, where we, we really expect the government to have a minimal amount of intervention and only intervene where absolutely necessary. That's the basic principle of good governance. Now, this particular principle was dramatically breached or violated in March 2020 all over the world except in Sweden when people, governments started imposing the lockdowns and so on, shut down international borders. Now, the uh, proportionality of this whole exercise uh, was what drove me initially into commenting both, I mean, particularly internally within the department where I had written significant, uh, you know, emails to senior officials. But also I have an ongoing blog on Times of India, which is, uh, you know, the world's largest English newspaper. And on that, I've written 17 articles uh, uh, before I resigned in September on this issue where I demonstrated that the age-based risk management, which is, by the way, what Martin Kaldoff of Harvard, uh, you know, public school, Harvard Medical School, he's a, he's a good friend. He has also been supporting, and of course, Sunetra Gupta from Oxford, etc. So we have eminent people, eminent public uh, health specialists supporting this common sense approach of risk-based management, which is essentially saying that those with at high risk, like the elderly, would need to be protected, whereas the those at lower risk can actually go ahead and even get the virus, right. and it will not really harm most of them. Yeah, and so that's the kind of uh, approach which was what I was advising within the Department of Treasury and Finance, as well as uh, publicly in my Times of India article. And uh, my Times of India article, by the way, was sharing with uh, India's cabinet secretary, which is uh, who is Rajiv Gobha, you know, from the Indian Administrative Service. We run all the major, uh, all the main positions of uh, the government in India. And uh, my close contacts and friendship with, uh, you know, my batchmates, we call them, uh, continued. And so I was sharing all this information with the, at the very highest level in India as well. Unfortunately, India did not listen either. So we had a real problem across the world where a lot of damage was done to the youth and to the children. And it continues to be done in many parts of the world. Let, let me ask yeah. you a couple of questions here. So what, what did you notice about your colleagues early on? Were they, did they just stop listening or were they... I mean, what was their reasoning why they weren't listening to you when they were like going crazy? I guess in, in the treasury in Victoria, there were many people with the same view. So we had a, a, a small team of economists. We would talk to each other and discuss this in some detail. And, uh, you know, and, and in fact, some of them adv advised even in much more detail to the senior officials of Victoria about the way to deal with this particular thing. So, no, there was a fairly decent level of, uh, I would say, quality uh, of th economic thinking within the treasury. 
but at the senior levels in the treasury, which is what I've, uh, you know, I question because it became very politicized. And I think the senior officials of the treasury did not question what they, you know, this particular policy of lockdowns, which was their fundamental job. So I think they breached their fundamental role. They're paid very heavily about $800,000, I think $700,000, the salary of our secretary. And uh, unfortunately, he's not done his job well. And I've, I've, I've actually questioned him quite significantly in a number of places. So uh, in India, however, I did not expect much uh, quality in any case because our batchmates in the Indian Administrative Service, many of them are very, very intelligent, extraordinarily competent people. However, they have uh, incentives, uh, which is what I've again written in my book, Breaking Free of Nehru, which reduce their quality as they grow older because they are rewarded for actually not producing anything at all. And so unlike in the uh, Australian system where you do have a contractual uh, c- you know, requirement for senior officials, in India, there's a permanent civil service to which I had belonged. And the permanent civil service, you get promoted regardless of what you do. So I, I think the quality in India has been extraordinarily poor. And so their management was shoddy. And of course, uh, this is very politicized. Remember, the main thing that happened here was the hysteria. That was, uh, you know, people went hysterical all over the world. Uh, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and at that stage, I think the politicians took over a thing which was basically a matter of public policy uh, and did not listen to any sane advice because they themselves perhaps were suffering from, uh, you know, the mass psychosis that had overtaken the society at that stage. Well, uh, it seems like a lot of that was driven by the media. Was the media in, in India and the media in Australia just as, as ridiculous and constantly putting it in everyone's faces? Before we continue... I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click support us today. Now back to the show. Yeah, yeah. So I think there were there were a couple of things that happened here. General Spalding in, in the USA and uh, with Michael Spanger, uh, Sanger and a few others, uh, a joint letter to the uh, intelligence agencies of the world where we point out that uh, something which is very obvious if you think about it, that these people are falling down in, in China and in Wuhan, the videos that were pumped out by China were entirely 100% fake. They really? Has, there has never been in the human history anyone falling down from a common cold, which is basically, a, this is a, a kind of a bad common cold. OK, and so what we get is, uh, is some cases, you know, people can't breathe, etc. But they, this has never happened ever that people fell down on streets. But there were so many videos pumped, paid and, sh- you know, put out by China. So there is a there's a significant 40 page letter that I've, I've written along with General Spalding and a few others uh, to this intelligence agencies of the world where we point out that China has actually planted this hysteria for very nefarious reasons for very, you know, uh, to basically harm the people of the West. And uh this stuff was not pointed out and not picked up by the intelligence agencies of the West, uh, and they haven't even picked up till today, which means that the media basically drummed up that hysteria. So the initial hysteria that was started by China became bigger and bigger. And then we had these uh, people who were effectively paid, uh, you know, institutions like the Imperial College of London, where they funneled lots of money by Jinping directly. You know, he actually visited the place. And so these guys came out with this phenomenal model which said that, you know, 500,000 people will die in, uh, in England and 100,000 in uh, Sweden and whatever. And these kind of models created the bigger hysteria. So at that point, I think once people became so hysterical, the idea of listening to reason probably became, you know, more and more distant. I suspect, however, that, uh, you know, even in such a bad situation, it was the role of senior officials uh, in the treasury. Uh, you know, we are, the treasury is basically the finance area, which we, you know, and we advise on all economic matters. We look at every single policy and advice cabinet. So if the, if the secretary of the department of treasury would insist at cabinet 
that sorry, but this is really, really wrong. The, you know, the lockdown policy, we need to follow the standard approach, which is what Sweden followed, which is social distancing voluntarily and so on and so forth, and no international border closures. Then we would, you know, we would have a bit of a better balance. So, but uh, I think uh, these are very, this is where I really feel bad that the, this uh, bureaucracy of Australia, which I thought was really good, failed us at a point in time when it was actually essential for it to put its foot down. And uh, I think we ended up in a very nasty situation at that point, and uh, we're still suffering from that. So there we are. But when, yeah, like in March and even in part of April, I was worried too. But then I thought, oh, when the numbers improve, okay, everything will be fine. But it seems like, you know, as of May, and obviously now, all reason is out the window. No one's looking at any reality. And now there's been tons of attempts to censor you know, and to criticize and to harass and to threaten anyone that says anything, you know, like the hysteria, I understand it affected people for a few months, but then, then what, what was the reason then that that government still continued to lock down and do all this ridiculous stuff? Well, you know, there's the sunk cost fallacy, which people are subject to, as you're probably aware that, you know, some, any, any bad decision that's been taken is then, you know, perpetuated by further by by the by the fact that you've taken you put so much effort into the bad decision that you now have to justify it i suspect the the governments uh, locked themselves into this into a big hole uh, in australia uh, roughly 400 billion dollars of uh, public money and wealth has been destroyed by the politicians now once they started burning up the money and you know paying people to stay at home and all that stuff there were you know millions of people staying at home I don't know about how many million, but at least I suppose a million or so in Australia at minimum. These guys were getting paid for doing nothing and that money was being borrowed from uh, future generations. Once you've locked in this program and that program ran for six months and then it extended for another six months. So basically the, in the government, there's a lot of lethargy. Once you start a program, you can't get out of it. And uh, the people then have incentives to continue that. So I think the sunk cost fallacy, the fact that there is no government program that actually ends, it is a tendency to continue forever. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. The, the inertia, it's like a Titanic. You know, once your Titanic moves in a particular direction, it's pretty hard to change it. So I, I guess the combination of all these are now at this stage where everything is very obvious. You know, when we look at the data of Sweden, which uh, I've been sharing widely across the world, that the only country that didn't have lockdowns was, as expected, has an excess death of about two to 3,000 people. That is what... I, my analysis shows that is what Michael Levitt's analysis shows. Michael Levitt is a Nobel Prize winner in biochemistry, reactive on, on Twitter. He's been, he's been doing this analysis for months now and helping the world to understand the nature of this particular data. And uh, he's very clear that this is not more than two to 3,000 out of an average annual uh, death of about 93,000 in Sweden. And if you look at the data, you can't even see this as being outside the range of normalcy. You know, it's, it's been in this range of fluctuation up and down. I've seen in the U.S. U.S., same thing. There's like zero excess deaths. Yep. I think there are a few more there, but uh, I, I think the, the data out there are a bit more any in any lockdown nation. So, you know, there was this British uh, member of parliament I was talking to uh, in a web, webinar where, you know, we had the former prime minister of Australia and some senior of senior politicians from the UK. And uh, the UK politicians are saying, no, but we have this excess deaths. And, uh, and you, the USA does have a few. And the, the argument I made there was very straightforward that uh, basically lockdowns actually kill. So if you compare the death rate of U, the UK and uh, the charts, the death, the death charts of the UK and Sweden, you actually see that UK has more deaths all, all said and done combined than Sweden. So lockdowns actually kill a lot more people. So the excess deaths will include not just the COVID deaths, but also those who died from fright and, and heart attacks and other things that they couldn't get treated or even in some cases suicide. So lockdown, so, so for countries like the USA, I've actually been writing articles on this in times of end. We need to have a very detailed methodology to distinguish between what would have otherwise happened without lockdowns and what has happened with lockdowns. And that is the basis of my complaint to the International Criminal Court, which is an extensive 150-page document, a 67,000-word document, where I provide uh, a sort of an outline of an initial methodology to distinguish between uh, what would have happened in a case like Sweden, where there was no lockdowns, and what would happen in the US, USA or UK or Australia with lockdowns. So lockdowns do kill. And uh, there's a Plenty of evidence that they, uh, in my view, they have killed around 2 million people in the world this year. 
and they've shortened the lives of hundreds of millions of people. That is my initial estimate. That is bit, uh, probably equal to or more than the actual COVID deaths last year. So, you know, we, we have a really terrible situation. Uh, and mind you, most of these uh, deaths that took place in, from lockdowns have occurred in countries like India. Because when India put its lockdowns in, you know, there was not even a payment to anybody who was affected. Okay, so yeah, what, are the, massive... what are the, the day workers do, the people that... If they don't Absolutely. work, they don't have money for that. Day. It was so shocking the way they were beaten up, brutalized, put into, you know, kind of quarantine systems and so on randomly. You know, it's a, it's a terrible situation with the brutalities on an unprecedented scale. And on top of that, these people were obviously without any income whatsoever. These people actually make a hand to mouth living. A vast number of them are daily wage workers. What is what it means is that these guys have zero money in the morning of the day. They go out to work come back with whatever a dollar or two worth of money in, in Indian rupees, then go and have some food for their family. That's their life. And for imagine a person of that condition, not having any income for two months, these guys were in desperate condition. I really cannot even count how many deaths would have occurred in India as a result. So we will get the data in due course. However, India's data uh, and record keeping is a terrible mess. And so a lot of people die in villages and we would never know about it. But uh, it's a very reasonable thing to say that in India, there would have been a vast number of deaths, as well as in countries like in Africa, where they imposed lockdowns, where there was simply no possibility of alternative income or a social support system like they have in Australia. Yeah, that's that's just crazy. I mean, you know, I know some people in Pakistan, they said the same thing about the day laborers. So, well... I mean, here we are. It's just about March. It's been a year and Britain is still locking people down and it's getting worse and worse and more abusive. Like at this point, like, I don't know, like, what do you expect to happen for this for the rest of 2021? I mean, just the same stupidity or do you think that this will somehow change? Yeah. Like, what do you think is going to happen? I've been absolutely shell shocked is the word at the uh, kind of policies that the politicians are undertaking, despite a vast amount of literature coming in from the great Baddington Declaration with Martin Kulloff and uh, Sunetra Gupta and all these wonderful public health experts. My book, The Great Hysteria and the Broken State, my complaint to the IC is extraordinarily deep. And, and in fact, my, as I said, the, se- the webinar in which you know, very senior politicians from the UK and Israel and uh, Australia were present, despite all that information being pumped into them, and of course, lots of articles uh, in newspapers, uh, I've written some, many others have written many. Despite all that information, despite all the evidence, there seems to be a complete lockdown of the government thinking process. The thinking machine has shut down. I've never expected such a thing on such a colossal scale. Uh, what I have now come to the view, and this happened in December, I, after realizing that the politicians are not budging at all, I decided that this, may not, this might need political action. And so I invited the youth of Australia to rise because you know there have been a lot of protests in australia and i'm not sure about the uk but i know about uh, oh, some UK, other parts of they've been protesting germany the uk a lot of countries but again they've been censored a lot of them i've seen the footage though yeah there we are so we have this uh you know youth who are getting really frustrated and in fact depressed and uh, suicidal in many cases they have come out on the streets in many parts of the world including in australia now i basically said to some of these people look you know, this is uh, uncoordinated uh, action, which will never make any difference to these politicians because they only worry about a thing if their job is threatened and their job can only be threatened in a democracy through the electoral process. If they start seeing the polls swinging against them, they might change their mind. And by the way, this reminds me the, of the most fundamental issue that the amount of hysteria created, by the way, has not gone. It's about 80 percent people are still hysterical. And so the polls are extraordinarily in- favorable to these politicians who are imposing all these lockdowns and border, border closures and so on, and now mandatory vaccines. So the polls are very favorable to them. So the only way to resolve this matter is to educate the community because the media is not doing that. The politicians are not doing that. <laughs> and and uh, the, these protests are going nowhere because they are so uncoordinated. So I've started a bit of a political movement in Australia where I'm uh, one of the, the leaders. I've collected some youth. I'm collecting some political parties who are not in the major uh, parties uh, which are running the country. And I'm hoping that that will then educate the country in Australia. And I'm expecting similar movements. Uh, in fact, I spoke to a South African channel the other day. And in my view, the uh, once the people realize that they've been fooled in such a large way, such a big way, 
I do not expect any of the existing politicians to have any political future. I'm reminded of Benito Mussolini. You know, that was an extreme case, but there is a time, there does come a time in the history of every politician who goes in the wrong direction, where the society corrects that politician. And uh, in the case of Indira Gandhi in India, we had the same thing with her emergency. You know, the first year, people were very happy with the emergency. But then within about a, about 18 months, they turned against Indira Gandhi and she lost power when the elections were held. I am expecting a similar thing to happen across the West now, where all these politicians will be moved out of their positions of power. However, this is a, this is a big if and proviso that we need to have a political movements across the world that will consolidate this particular issue and bring in new faces and which are credible as well as competent so that the people will not only have the, the knowledge that this has been a great hysteria and uh, been a great fraud effectively, on the people, but they will also have confidence in the alternative because unfortunately you do not want, and I would never want uh, an incompetent set of leaders anywhere in the world. So we have a real problem here where the competent people are actually supposed to be in, in the existing parties, but these guys have failed us. So now we have to assemble another brand new set of leaders who will then take their place. So what do you think of the current leadership in, you know, in various countries? They just, they don't care? They're just doubling down or well, well, they, we do have, like we do have, continue. yeah, we do have, you know, even in the UK, I, I noticed in the USA, we have uh, Kirsty Norm and we have, you know, uh, Kirsty Norm has been the very best of all in South Dakota. And mm-hmm. I think there's a guy called Charles Walker or somebody, I forget the name, but uh, uh, in the UK, there have been a few uh, MPs who have been criticizing these uh, mass atrocities uh, quite well in the parliament. Likewise, in Australia, we have Craig Kelly in the parliament who's been criticizing uh, the uh, some of the policies of the Liberal Party. In fact, he resigned from the the ruling Liberal Party and ha- is now sitting as an independent. So we have one or two people in every part of the world who have been raising their voice. We probably need them to be our leaders. At this point, I would expect Craig Kelly to be one of the main leaders. Hopefully, uh, he will join us in the work that I'm working on so that we become the, he becomes the seed of this movement. You know, we, th- these are the good people who actually stand for liberty and good governance. And if these people can come forward. So as I see the, and for all, you know, and I'm reminded of uh, Timur Kuran, who was my professor in the U- uh, university of Southern California. And he wrote his wonderful book. Uh, what is it? Uh, the preference for about preference falsification a preference falsification occurs when people are not telling you what they really believe this is quite possible it can happen uh, that explains why the ussr suddenly ch- you know changed its its mind on uh, communism it was very abrupt and that abruptness can only be explained by the fact that there's a vast latent uh, dissent or or a feeling of uh, you know not agreeing with the government that then suddenly comes out once the opportunity comes so i i would imagine if you are lucky that in the next few months, there would be such a kind of a turning point in the West where I would imagine if any country, any country changes its uh, plans and, uh, you know, moves forward in, a, in the opposite direction, then all the others would follow. It's a very interesting scenario that, uh, you know, we have to watch for. But as I said, I'm not waiting for it. I will start working yeah. on that plan. It seems like, I don't know, from I've heard about Australia and New Zealand. I mean, they're literally setting up concentration camps for you know, people that supposedly have COVID. I mean, I, I was shocked. To be, you know, I mean, I thought they were very democratic places, but they seem to have become more draconian than almost anywhere I know of. Uh, yes, you're absolutely right. They have been talking about these concentration camps in the deserts. They're not called concentration camps, obviously. They're called quarantine camps, quarantine areas. But the, uh, and in Victoria, we're talking about doing this in Avalon and a few other places. So that's not a desert, but it's pretty much outside Melbourne. The, the reason being that these guys tried to contain a virus that cannot be contained under all the scientific principles uh, that we have with us in the literature. Flu-like virus, like this one is, is unlike Ebola, which can be contained with quarantines. Okay, so we have a, there's a great science behind what kind of a vi- virus is suitable for a quarantine and, and measles is and uh, some other, uh, you know, yellow fever and so on, which are not viruses, but bacteria, I suppose uh, they are. But uh, this particular one is not. And uh, when they try to contain it in hotels, so they had this uh, people brought in and uh, into into various hotels in in Melbourne, and invariably the thing would break out of the hotel. You know, it would get out. And so, in the first instance, it went out and and caused eight hundred deaths in in Melbourne, mostly obviously the elderly. Once it leaked out from the ho- on the hotel quarantine, it went into the nursing homes and killed eight hundred people. Now the uh, then the finally, you know, by by I think three and a half months or four months of complete lockdown, twenty three hours a day curfew at night, 
God knows, you know, the most extreme form of lockdowns, uh, they finally managed to bring it under some control. But the idea that they could quarantine people for such a virus is so foolish as to be unbelievable. Uh, and yet these guys are uh, doing it. And I really, you're absolutely right. They have gone into the extreme. And I'm going to the Minister of Health, the Health Minister of uh, Australia. His name is Greg Hunt. He is from the uh, state of Victoria and, in fact, from uh, Melbourne. I will be going very shortly outside his office in Melbourne, in, in Melbourne because uh, that's his constituency. And I'll be giving a speech today where I will explain, you know, the, the kind of irrational policies and the lies that have been told. So what we see with these quarantines, uh, and that's one of the things I've written about in The Spectator recently, that the idea of quarantine was actually not even found in the Victorian pandemic plans. You know, we have been planning all over the West, and, yet, and we had very specific things saying that when a flu-like virus is found, people will be asked to isolate at home, which is what Sweden did and which is you know, the right approach. I don't think even other countries have done you know, quarantines. I, I suspect Canada is trying to do that, I understand. Most other countries did not no, even I mean, try and, to do and, that. Yeah, and, and, no, in different countries, I mean, they've done many different things. You know, in the U.S., thankfully, each state is different. But some yes. states, yeah, are just ridiculous. Some are not so bad. It just depends. But do you, do you think that there um, are any large players behind this that are pushing it or have kind of created this scenario and are continuing to push it? Or is that, oh, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I'm 100, 100% convinced. Uh, so there's a, there is a hierarchy of these uh, players. At the very top of it is uh, Xi Jinping. I don't know how you pronounce his name, but Xi Jinping, the president of uh, China. This guy has come in power in 20, 2012 or 2013, and since then he's done the Belt and Road Initiative. He's a very high quality, very high intelligence uh, player who has maneuvered his, uh, himself into a lifelong position like uh, Mao, Mao Zedong, an unbelievable posi- position where you, know, you can control 1.4 billion people and uh, straightjacket them into your particular you know, approach. He is at the very top of this thing, and he's, uh, that's the, my number of articles on this issue and the 40-page letter, etc., on, but below him are organizations like the WHO and uh, the institutions like Imperial College, which have been effectively controlled by China. So, you know, think of Ted Ross, for example. Ted Ross, the, the WHO chief, was actually appointed by China. They managed to oh corral God. all the Belt and Road, uh, you know, votes of Africa, about 50 odd votes, and put them into, you know, Ted Ross's side against uh, Nabarros, who was from the UK, and he was then ousted uh, as the candidate. But Nabarros has been fantastic. And if he was our uh, WHO chief, he would not have had these things. So they, first of all, was at the top is Xi Jinping, then is WHO. WHO is very closely associated with a lot of pharmaceutical companies, including uh, the Bill Gates and Melinda Foundation. So these guys have obviously a very strong interest, <laughs> you know, the vaccine companies, very strong interest in, in profiting from this thing. So Australia, for example, has bought 150 million doses of vaccines. The population of Australia is 23, 25 million, and that includes children. So you imagine buying six times more of vaccines, number one. Uh, number two, most of the people of Australia are not going to take the vaccines. That's very clear from what they're saying. So imagine that you've bought 12 times the actual number of vaccines that you need. And uh, who's paying for that? That's a taxpayer. So the, obviously the vaccine companies, which, by the way, are the big funding organizations for these political parties. So political parties need a lot of money. And where do they get the money from? From this big pharma. So this is a, this is a beautiful <laughs> kind of a collaborative effort by these, uh, you know, by the second and third tier, uh, the pharma companies. And below that, I would argue, are uh, the media companies. Media companies are profiting enormously from the eyeballs. They were actually dying. If you go back in time and look at the situation in the February of 2020, a large number of them were making losses and they were shutting down one after the other because of social media becoming so big. And so now that they have got these eyeballs, they've come back in, come back to life. They love the idea of hysteria. So we have a kind of lock-in situation where everybody benefits, all these big players benefit. So now, remember, the first one is a, is a strategic beneficiary, which is China. But all the others are economic beneficiaries. So in, economic incentives explain to me significant amount of this particular, you know, chaos that we're seeing, but not the entire chaos. The, first of all, we need to recognize the strategic advantage to China which has actually grown during the last year. And in fact, if you look at the shipping container prices, uh, they're now shot up by 10 times from China. If you want to bring in some stuff, yeah, because there's so much export happening, nobody else is producing anything in the world. So China is booming while the world has shut down effectively. Well, yeah, I mean, I would think though, if the prices go up, well, I guess it's a captive market, right? That China is producing. If someone else was, then 
people would run away screaming in the high prices, right? Well, uh, this, that, that's going to happen as well. Uh, uh, that's actually the reason why we're going to see significant inflation is my guess, because uh, the dollar is going to fall. As the, as the dollar falls, the ex- imports to the USA are going to skyrocket in price. Now, US is obviously a trade deficit country where, you know, effectively uh, it, it produces less than what it imports. And that's perfectly fine in a normal situation. But now if the prices of the imports rise dramatically, which is what is expected, uh, and your ability to tax the population is reduced to pay for all the services, you start you're going to start seeing a significant problem in the USA, and that will then trans- transmit to the rest of the world the inflationary expectations which we're starting to see in the bond market already. So I, I'm expecting a bit of a problem here for the world to happen in 2021, and what we started in 22 is probably last year is not the end of the problems, it's probably the beginning. Because we've strengthened China dramatically. It has taken over uh, Hong Kong. It is going to take over Taiwan without a problem. It can actually become a major threat to Australia itself. But on top of that, we have weakened the US dollar. We weakened the West completely in terms of thousands and I think potentially trillions of dollars of wealth being destroyed. Uh, we have uh, created inequalities on an unprecedented scale because, you know, big companies and Zoom and, and all these companies, they've profited at the expense of the small business. So we've created massive inequalities. We are, we, we have created all the, all the situation, you know, the, this is a recipe for disaster, which I, I think everybody can see the writing on the wall, but no one is willing to wake up and fix the problem. Do you think that uh, the virus itself was released deliberately by China or was it just a happy accident for them? What are your thoughts there? I've had a, not a very detailed look, but from what I could say, because there were a couple of articles in the New York Times that explored this so-called, uh, you know, whistleblower who was from Hong Kong and who was then interviewed uh, in, uh, I think, one of the major channels of the USA. And then there were articles in the time in the, in the New York Times. There was, and there were academics in the USA who said this was the most bogus paper, that this whistleblower's paper was such a pile of rubbish. It had nothing, no credible information in it. That means the whistleblower was a plant. Now, the fact that the whistleblower is a plant does not mean necessarily that the virus was uh, not released deliberately. I have no view on this at the moment. I believe the story, uh, the story should be examined further. But that's really only one part of the story. We should not be blindsided by looking at that story to the main obvious fact, which is in front of us, that China created all these panic panicky videos which are fake 100 percent fake and that they caused this hysteria across the world and they managed to uh, effectively cause the west to self-destruct that hysteria has been way more problematic than the virus itself which has actually not been that bad ultimately it's it just been one of the you know worse than a bad flu like a hong kong flu or something it's not a spanish flu so the virus might might or might not have been released i'm not very sure of that but the biggest problem really is that the hysteria has been caused by China, and yet the world has not woken up to that fact. So, I mean, the powers that be in the various nations around the world, I mean, they have intelligence agencies. You would think they would actually know what's going on, wouldn't they? But uh, Which is do why, you, uh, yeah. Do you think absolutely. they know and they just don't care? And now it's like, hmm, okay, what are we going to do to happened- solidify our position? It's, it's a, again, economics explains a hell of a lot of things in, in life, okay? And so in my case, I'll, I'll tell you why I resigned. I've reached a point in my career where I can somehow cope because I'm, I'm 61. I was, I resigned just before the age of 61. I have somehow managed to reach a point in my career where if necessary, I can live off the state pension. I mean, so my economic position is not very fragile. I, I can cope with the next seven years uh, of my life where, and then the age pension kicks in and I can, you know, survive in this country. Most people, unfortunately, are not in that condition where they can leave a job. Okay, so that explains almost 99% of the situation where people are working inside intelligence agencies as economists and in, as police officers, even though they know that this is really bad and this is harmful, they are not in a personal position because the cost and benefit to individuals should add up. If they are going to sacrifice their job, the cost to them is humongous and the benefit is not guaranteed because they can see my example. I resigned for five months. No one is listening to me. OK, so I have to struggle even more. I'm now going to organize political resistance. Imagine the kind of cost I'm paying. I have lost my salary for seven months, for six months. I am now going to have to struggle for another few uh, months or maybe a year or two to to fight this particular problem. I might go to jail. I might be, you know, I might face all sort of consequences. But have you been threatened? Have you uh... You know, have you have you gotten any threats or anything? What's happened? No, there's not been a threat as such, but you know the the idea of uh, police uh, arresting you, etc., is pretty standard. You know, so if I go for a speech today, 
I, I'm not saying the police will arrest me, but uh, you know they might. Uh, you know, so they have arrested a hell of a lot of people in in in, uh, in Australia in the past. So in Melbourne as well. So really, uh, I what I'm trying to say is that the, the the cost benefit, if you think about it, what is the benefit to me of leaving my job? Zero. I've got zero benefit. What is the cost? It's humongous. So if people and by the way, I had the little bit of savings to survive. I've just run out of my savings, and so that's where my wife comes in as my secret weapon where she's now working as a part-time you know, person and so we can survive somehow. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, it's an individual decision. Economics is very individual. You know, th- this is where economics is so beautiful. I've written a little book on for children, the Seeing the Invisible. I, I really think you know, that uh, it's a small book I've written for everybody up to the age of 100. It's a little book which explains how beautifully economics explains everything. In this case, I can explain why a lot of good people are still functioning within the government, within intelligence agencies, maybe they're providing written advice to their superiors, okay? But the stage has not yet come where they're willing to resign. That stage does not easily come. Let me assure you that even in Nazi Germany, I'm sure there were a lot of people who were working with Hitler who didn't really support him, but they had no choice at that stage in terms of economic uh, you know, survival. So, hey, what do we do? This is, our, this is our nature. You know, putting food on the table is the first priority for every family. If you, don't, if you can't put food on the table, how can you possibly fight for other things? Well, do you think that you're more powerful now that uh, you're, you've resigned? Or, you know, how come you didn't think, okay, how can I, within my position, influence? Did you, I, did you try a lot of that? And it just oh, yes, I did. Absolutely. I tried for six months. I think uh, I would it'd be fair to say that I tried for six months to influence my department from within. And uh, I, you know, it was not successful. Let me just say that not just me alone, but there were many others. The issue with me, however, is slightly different. I have resigned my job in India to come to Australia. This was my part-time hobby to work. I mean, I have to survive with the job, but it was not really my main goal. My main goal has always been for the last 20 years to address India's governance system. So for me, the, the main focus has been my Times of India articles, my uh, political party that's running in India and so on for the last few years. So uh, this particular work that I was doing inside the government here was being supported in a, I've got a decent social media presence. I wouldn't say excessive, but I've got a somewhat reasonable social media presence. And so I have always been talking about this issue from the beginning on my social media. Now, the point when they started beating up people in Victoria, I started calling this a police state. Okay. That's the yeah. first time I ever commented on, on Australia in, in, a, in a long time. I normally would comment only on India. That's why my Times of India articles focus on India. Now, when they asked me, to withdraw both my direct and indirect criticism of the Victorian government, then it became untenable. I cannot possibly withdraw my indirect criticism of the Victorian government because all my articles on Times of India are an indirect criticism of the Australian government as well because uh, they oppose lockdowns. I've opposed lockdowns from the very beginning, uh, day one. And so essentially, I had no choice but to resign. So I was not effective within, the, within the, my role uh, in terms of getting the message out. After getting out of the role, I was able to at least write in the Australian newspapers. So far, I've been writing in Indian newspapers, but now I was able to write in the Australian newspapers, which probably brought me some, uh, let's say, some, uh, this information became more widely known within Australia. So, you know, some news channels and others interviewed me and so on. So I was able to get the message out. That has also not worked, unfortunately. So uh, I think in terms of the influence and power, whatever, I don't, I'm not talking about power. I'm talking about influence. Yes, I definitely do have more influence now by uh, talking you know, more publicly because the influence within my department was not successful. And if I continued within the department in that condition where I was actually being asked to stop criticizing Victoria, that was not tenable, you understand, so, Richard? So, you know, uh, how, I have left my job in India. Uh, well, well, to what fight. happened if you said, I'm not resigning, I'm not re- retracting, you know, piss off. What would they have done? Uh, I think my uh, point at that stage was I, I took the decision in, a, in, in about five minutes. It didn't take me too long to decide. My view was that I had much more to say uh, and that uh, I was being stopped. And so my job at that stage, as I told you, economically speaking, that's where everything comes in. The, uh, that food on the table was not a desperate condition for me. Okay, If I can put food on my table for seven more years, I can survive. And I think we have sufficient savings for seven years. So as I said, once the economics is not the critical factor, then you look, look at the overall uh, cost and benefit. And for me, the idea was that I can now start communicating the broader message, not just to the Indian people through my Times of India blogs, but also to Australia, which is what I've started doing. Uh, so I think that, that the decision was very clear, made in five minutes, and it was something I would do again anytime. So from here, you said you want to get, to, I guess, a political movement going. What, what do you think is going to work? Like, what's your plan from here? 
I think the the uh, the first step is to organize the youth. So they they I've, I've been working practically 14 hours a day on on this project now. And uh, like I'm going to this, uh, you know, event with the health minister of Australia, Greg Hunt's office today, there'll be a lot of other people. These speeches are to be recorded and uh, communicated, you know, memes and uh, social media. Uh, so educating the community, is the first step, which is what I'm trying to get at. Uh, we, we need to get uh, talented people involved. So a lot of good, talented people are con- connecting with me on a daily basis. Uh, doctors, engineers and uh, designers and marketing experts and everybody. A lot of people are very disgusted with what's going on. Okay, I get a hell of a lot of support. <laughs> this is a very strange thing from a lot of people in Australia and across the world. But so the, I, the plan is like the, there was a newspaper that asked me and news.com, you know, it's a big newspaper in Australia. They asked me yesterday about this. What, what's my plan? I said, I have no real plan because my plan is to support everybody who wants to get back to normal. And that means the more the people that join, you know, the, the better for everybody. So, and, and the sooner this happens, the better. So I have no real plan that I want to, you know, go there or go anywhere. I just want to get back to normal. And so if the more the people that, jo- that join, the better, the sooner the message gets out to the people. I think we, we, we get the job done quicker. So, and if it doesn't happen, uh, we just keep working on it. So really, how can you plan a thing in such a terrible situation where you're fa- effectively facing the world's largest crimes against humanity since uh, World War, since Hitler's time? As I've written, I complained, you know, these are crimes against humanity in a situation where the governments are terrorizing their people left, right and center across the world. Borders are shut down. Lockdowns are happening. Uh, mandatory masks outdoors and everywhere else. And now mandatory vaccine. When you're having such massive totalitarianism and the power and the police and the defense and the guns are with the government and not with us, how can I, as a common man, tell us what is the plan? So I basically have no plan except to keep explaining to the people why this is wrong. And that, I think, is the only plan I have, really. What's it like in Australia now? Is is it uh, are there still lockdowns or is it just no tourism? No one can leave or come in, but life is okay. or how is it like? Well, it, it varies from different uh, from state to state. Many states have had very short periods of lockdowns, very few lockdowns, maybe for a week or so. The borders have been closed very tightly and shut down and no one allowed to in or to get out for the last one year from practically anywhere in Australia. But there were a few leakages of the sort from uh, in, in Melbourne. And that uh, uh, initially, as I said, led to this uh, leakage from the quarantine, which led to this massive lockdown for three and a half months, which is the most terrorist kind of lockdown I can imagine, which finally did work, so-called in the sense of stopping uh, the spread further. And then now we are basically released from uh, the most draconian conditions. Today, for example, yesterday, for till, till yesterday, there was a limit of 20 people outside uh, in Melbourne. Uh, but from today, it's 100 people. So we are now starting to effectively become more normalized in terms of our life here. But of course, masks are mandatory in public transport as well as in some new places. So uh, this varies across the Australia. But as you can see, all the entire tourism industry has died, effectively completely dead, except a few internal tourism uh, you know, activities. The retail industry, the hospitality industry uh, has effectively dead, except the ones that do takeaways, uh, because you're, uh, you're not allowed to sit inside. And if you do, you have to do the QR codes and you know, sign in who you are, and nobody wants to do that. So effectively, that industry you're died. You're not allowed to eat in restaurants still? No, no, no. You're not allowed to eat unless you sign up. And uh, that will happen now. You know, if you sign up your name and put QR codes and all that, then you can do that. But uh, in many parts of, uh, particularly in Melbourne, for months on end, there was no such possibility. Many other industries have died. The youth have been uh, telling me about the kinds of things that they, they had plans for. Their entrep- some entrepreneurs had plans. All of them died because uh, particular things make it impossible. The supply chains are effectively dead. Uh, things cannot come in. As you know, all over the world, the supply chain waiting times are now the highest ever in uh, the last I don't know how many decades uh, people are waiting 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 for things to come uh, mostly from China but even other parts of the, of the world so effectively uh, I would say there's been a wipeout economically but the, that doesn't affect the majority the majority of people uh, probably don't even leave Australia on, a, on an annual basis for a holiday okay so the majority are still happy with that who are working within their you know homes and other little small uh, whatever businesses particularly the ones in offices central business districts you know the knowledge workers they're working from home because of the modern technology allows them to do that so I guess uh, the majority of this country is quite satisfied with being locked down <laughs> so really? we are facing so a real problem so people don't I mean, so are there any cases? They're, they're asking you to wear a mask. There's no indoor dining. 
and there's like no cases? There are, I think, a couple of cases were detected in, in Victoria yesterday. So the cases are practically close to zero now after having been massively locked down and coerced. So now the cases are very few. But uh, uh, despite that, they have this massive set of precautions, you know, where everybody should wear masks here and there and so on. So it's, it's all mandatory, by the way. So you can't even say that I'm not wearing because of my choice. So we have an acceptance by the community uh, at large of, these, of, of this lifestyle. So, yeah, it's a very challenging exercise to educate the community about the unnecessary nature of this whole thing. What do you think is going to happen with the vaccinations? Do you think they're just going to, I mean, have they forced it on people yet in Australia? Are they going to? Like, what do you think is happening here? Yeah, that's actually been a a turning point of sorts, I would argue, uh, in terms of the community expectations and, you know, preferences. If you, I don't know whether you recall, a few days ago, there was the final of the Australian Open Tennis uh, Tournament. And after the finals, uh, there was a speech by the head of the uh, Australian Open Tennis, or whatever it is called. And uh, she mentioned about the vaccines first, and there was booed very heavily by the crowd. And then she mentioned, uh, you know, she thanked the Victorian government and was booed even more. So the vac- So what we see here is that the community does not want uh, a mandatory vaccine. One of the reasons is that uh, this vaccine obviously is only an experimental vaccine. So we, we know, everybody knows that this has not been thoroughly tested among the elderly, among the people with immunocompromised disorders, uh, among the pregnant, among the children. And so that all these tests will continue now in a post-market manner. That is to say... After they have been released, the vaccines, then people who take these will be studied. And that's why you have massive amounts of collection of data going on. And uh, there are significant cases, reported cases. But the uh, problem with this kind of a vaccine is that uh, it also, they keep telling us that even if you take a vaccine, you still may transmit. Therefore, you will have to continue life as usual. So people are wondering, I think, uh, on average, that, hey, the vaccine doesn't work. And they are trying it on us without even having confirmed thoroughly the whole thing. Uh, so what's the bloody point of it? So I think there is a bit of resistance, uh, I may say. And that's probably the turning point. I, I would expect that the vaccine issue will be more problematic for the governments now than the lockdowns were. Because the majority might not want the vaccine. Well, good. I mean, yeah, I hope it, they, they overplayed their hand and it leads to their own destruction. That's the hope. That's the hope, yeah. So, very good. Sanjeev, where are you speaking you know i know you're doing podcasts like this but where where can people find out more about your views and where can they go to hear from you well my blog uh, sublog city is probably the only uncensored place i have my twitter account is currently blocked for seven days uh, because i commented and said that these are experimental vaccines and that was got me into a seven-day jail in the twitter my the facebook has uh, uh, has done the same thing twice uh, i do have facebook i do have twitter i do have uh, telegram and of course my blog and I write on Catalaxy Files, I write on Times of India. I also have the book and the ICC complaint and so on. So there's a lot of stuff around where I write a lot here and there. But I do get blocked periodically by social media. And, I might, and by the way, I was banned completely and permanently by LinkedIn. LinkedIn has banned me 100% and they've removed my account. So it is a bit challenging for people to find me, but not that bad. If they, if they, if they spell my name, I'm sure they'll find plenty of material on Google search to immediately access my books, uh, my uh, writings, uh, my comments on Telegram. So Telegram hasn't censored me yet. So my Telegram channel is growing. Uh, that's one place where people can you know, follow me. So look, it's, yeah. it's all very uh, complex in this world. As I said, uh, where censorship is now becoming like 1984. It's not just the government that's censoring. It is the big companies that are censoring as well. So well, they've situation- also got, gotten people to censor themselves too. I mean, they've gotten your neighbor to turn against your neighbor and yeah. Yes. It's terrible. it's terrible now. Well, very good. Sanjeev, um, can you spell out the name of your blog so that people can find it and your Telegram channel? Where, what are they? I think on Telegram, it's uh, S sub bloke. S, uh, that is uh, S-S-A-B-H-L-O-K. Uh, okay. That's my Telegram channel. And uh, the other one is uh, my blog, which is S-A-B-H-L-O-K-C-I-T-Y, sublokecity.com. So okay. it should be okay. Yeah, it should be easy to get. Very good. Well, Sanjeev, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Richard. Uh, hopefully this uh, will be heard by a few people and hopefully somebody might wake up in the process. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? 
Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.